Hello YouTube, it's uh, FS Derek again and uh, in our brand new plane which as you can see has got less than three hours on the clock we're going to have another short flight and this time I want to check and see if the radio navigation is working now GPS didn't always exist and um, before GPS we used to fly using a system of radio beacons and th that system still exists and it's called the VOR system and VOR stands for VHF Omnidirectional Rangefinder and they are strategically placed all over the world um, to assist in navigation they are and they're very useful for the um, private pilot so I'll just explain uh, very quickly a bit about how it works and then we will dial one in and fly there and then use it to fly back now how do you find out the uh, where that where they are the VOs are well uh, you can uh, in the FSX use the GPS and here we have the uh, standard Garmin let's just if we uh, press and hold clear that resets that and you can see that I'm sitting on the um, Alpha hold for 28 departure at Manston Echo Golf Mike Hotel and there's no scenery now that's that's a bit of a glitch because I've got VFR scenery you'll notice that um, if I if I increase the range or zoom out that the black area to the left is France and that is shown as land whereas the uh, the area that I've got the VFR scenery for shows a sea it doesn't that's the only thing that it affects it doesn't um, the rest of the navigation data is there and the things we're looking for are these blue things there's, there's Dover there there's uh, Rochester there uh, and down here we've got LID LYD and what we're going to do is we're going to let's just zoom in a bit we're going to fly down to this Dover VOR now we need to find its frequency because they, each one of them has got a frequency which consists of three digits decimal point and then a further two digits uh, and so if we go if we click on nearest you can see that we've got tables of what are nearest various nearest things so if I click between the pages of nearest there's the, all the nearest airports including my hotel where we are and that's nearest intersections which are more um, of use when you're flying airliners nearest uh, non-directional beacons which we'll cover perhaps on the way back they're like VORs except they uh, um, they just um, transmit equally in every direction so they're just useful to um, you can find your way towards them and here are the VORs so the nearest VOR is the DVR Dover VOR and currently it's on a bearing from us of 182 it's 10.8 nautical miles away and its frequency is 11495 and that's what we want 11495 so if I press shift 3 and just clear away the GPS we need to set 11495 into the nav1 box we've got two boxes on here and they're identical this top one here has comms on the left and nav on the right and the second one has also is an identical box comms on the left nav on the right and the top one is the one that we need here now how do you put 11495 in the active frequency on this well what you can do is you can with your mouse button adjust the frequency and you'll notice that all you can adjust is the non-active frequency what you have to do is is get the non-active frequency the inactive frequency correct and then let's get that to 11495 and then you press this double headed arrow and that will swap between the two so you can't really see that that's swapped so let's set that to another frequency and press that and you can see that they, they swaps between the two now another way to do it and it's the uh, again it's the old-fashioned way but it's actually um, a bit easier if there's a lot of turbulence or um, you can't um, let's zoom in a bit yeah, well, make it easier for you. Um, the other way of doing it is to press the N button and N 
selects the nav so um, we want there are two navs don't forget nav 1 and nav 2 so we want nav 1 so we press N1 and you have to press it pretty quickly N1 or you can I'll show you just press N2 N1 and then just use plus and minus to set and then when you want to set the second digit press N twice in N and you can then set that to what you want and then all you need to do is click on the double headed arrow to make that active so now we've got the Dover VOR dialed into our box so what use is that well we can use another instrument to tell us where the VOR is now and that is this instrument here and this uh, this vertical uh, indicator will tell us and this uh, triangle will tell us where it is so you adjust that with this needle here and it's fairly intuitive if you think about it to understand that when the needles in the middle we are it will give us the direction to fly to the VOR and sure enough it's given us about 185 which is what the GPS gave us so basically what we're going to do is we've tuned it in and we're going to take off and fly 185 towards the um, VOR so let's let me zoom out to my favorite 0.5 zoom and I'll um, make my way down to the holding point alpha which is where we were cleared to by uh, Manston I've done uh, run-ups and everything so we're all clear to go Right, clear for takeoff. So let's just check down the runway that nothing's going on. Now with brakes, you have got differential brakes. You can do a lot with this plane on the uh, rudder. But you might want to um, to brake uh, hard to uh, turn around the corner. And the way you do that is on the number pad you use the minus key and the star key and that's um, sometimes incorrectly shown on the um, the various key summaries so if I show you if I just taxi a bit and then press the minus key that is equivalent to pressing the right brake and it will turn the plane to the right um, what you need to do to turn back is to taxi and then press the star key to turn back and that's that's pretty intuitive uh, it's quite frequently shown as the plus and minus key um, and which are above each other so that doesn't really make much sense so um, let's uh, press F7 put down 10 degrees of flaps and we're not perfectly aligned anymore but uh, we're okay the engines precessing to the left again so I'm putting in quite a bit of right rudder to hold it straight and uh, we're pretty quickly off so it's just because it's showing it's a bit too lively and showing a bit too much of a tendency to climb I'm really holding the nose down here because we want to get up to 80 knots before we climb and there we are we're established in the climb at 80 knots now how fast do you climb at 80 knots and the answer is how long is a piece of string you climb whatever whatever you're climbing at. It depends a lot on the density of the air, which in turn depends on the temperature. So that's 80 knots. We're climbing at about 750 feet per minute. Let me put the flaps up. And you can see we've got a reduced drag. So if we continue to hold it at uh, 80, 90 knots, 85 knots, and wait until it settles down, you can see we've got a climb rate of um, 1200 feet a minute which is um, really quite quick now we need to turn on to 180 so I'm going to turn left I'm going to go over there at 2000 feet because it doesn't with VORs it's 
entirely independent of the um, the feet, the height. Now, supposing we were flying along uh, on the on the top of the white band, and we were only climbing at 300 feet a minute. What would we do? Would we raise the nose? And the answer is no, of course not. Basically, you climb at the best rate, and the best rate is at uh, the top of the white band, and whatever rate you get is the rate you get. So don't be tempted to try and climb faster or slower just because you're not getting the rate of climb that you want. This aircraft is it climbs most efficiently at uh, at the correct airspeed. So we're leveling off. So we're going to do our um, attitude power trim. So let's pop the old throttle back a bit. Now you'll notice that this needle is not lining up anymore, and that's because we went quite a way east when we took off. So if we're going to just do a straightforward fly straight to the VOR then we can adjust that and we can now now find we've got about a track of 175 to get there and we're said to be flying the 175 radial now there are there are in fact 180 radials when you see these things on the ground, they are big circles with lots of dots around the outside which transmit the radials. And every other degree there's a radial, so there's a zero radial, two radial, four radial, six radial, and that's enough radials. And of course if you're flying direct to a VOR, then that's fine, that's really all you need to know. The frequency. The other thing you really should do is um, ident it. And basically that means listen to the Morse code that it's transmitting. Which in this case is DVR. Now you can, if you learn Morse code, then you would know that that was DVR. Even if you have a passing interest in Morse code, you probably know a few characters. So you know S is dot 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 and O is dash dash dash, E is a dot, H is four dots, D is a dot and two dashes. So I know I know that the first initial of that is D. And in fact on every uh, book or manual or chart you'll find that um, there'll be the Morse code will be there for you so you can check that so we're happy that that's that's transmitting DVR well, and that means it's working and so we're, we're happy now we've checked two things there first of all we've checked that we are tuned into the Dover VOR and we haven't made a massive mistake and tuned into the Detling one by mistake um, flying completely the wrong direction and also we we know that it's serviceable it's happy it's not transmitting do not use or SOS or something <laughs> It's not off the air. If it was off the air, we'd worry, wouldn't we? Now, what happens if the needle goes off to the side? Well, you just follow the needle. We're going to actually try and see this. Uh, on the VFR scenery, it should be there. So how far off the side do you go? Well, 30 degrees is, is, is more than adequate. Um, and of course the closer you are to it the more quickly you're going to correct and come back on track if you're um, 200 miles away from a VOR and there are some that you can pick up from 200 miles away then uh, it might take you quite a long time to get back on the radial that you've selected in which case you can just select another radial just fly a different radial to the VOR as you get closer and closer you want to make your corrections less and less because as you can see we've corrected and overshot so it's coming back online now so 
so now we want to turn towards the, the heading that's indicated at the top here which is about 175 I'm working on the basis that the VOR is located on land <laughs> which would make a lot of sense rather than floating about in the sea we should be able to see it pretty soon and what you're looking for is like a fairy ring type uh, white structure usually in the middle of a farmer's field doesn't have to be, can be on an airfield with VORs there's a few things you have to be aware of first of all if it's on an airfield then you have to make sure you don't infringe the space the control zone around the airfield which generally extends for 2,000 feet above the ground level of the airfield it's telling me it's off to the left again we should be able to see it about now I'm going to deliberately fly slightly to the right so that we can see it out of the left hand window The other thing is that uh, VORs are, are uh, a point of congestion and you can imagine that uh, lots of people are using them Where is it? I should know where this is from memory I'll have to read this No, it's come back on the nose again Look, it's gone off the other side we're going to go right over the top of it, which which means we're going to have trouble seeing it. I'm going to see this. I am going to see this. Let's cut the throttle a bit. Now it's behind us. Now you can tell it's behind us because this triangle has gone from pointing upwards to pointing back. So I'm going to cut the throttle and turn around and just do a quick look around and see what we can see. Yeah, so they get congested. So um, when you've got everybody and his grandmother flying away from and towards VORs, You can imagine the airspace can get pretty congested. Let's not stall. Watch that airspeed. So it's not a bad idea when you get close to a VOR if you're just flying uh, as a private pilot just take a short cut, cut the corner off. I'm going to um, turn this round until it's pointing towards it and then that will tell me where it is. See it was telling me it's north? So I'm going to turn north and have a look. And there it is. Can you see it? They've actually modelled it. I have to keep an eye on my airspeed and make sure we don't get closer than 500 feet. And there it is there. It's got a fence around it because they don't want anybody um, interfering with it and knocking out navigation aids. And the airliners rely on these. It's pretty accurate. You can see it on the VFR scenery, can't you? And you can also see it on the um, flight simulator scenery. So that's the VOR. Now, in the same way as you can fly towards them, you can fly away from them. So if you know in which direction from a VOR something is, and how far, then you can dial in on here where you want to go. So if I know Manston is north, if I dial in north, that needle will tell me Go back. Let's just climb up a bit. That needle will tell me how to fly a direct line from the VOR to Manston. It's telling me I need to be over to the right, so I need to be somewhere heading somewhere between north and 030. So if I head 030 while climbing at the best climb speed back up to 2000, 
it's going to um, pretty quickly um, tell me that I'm I'm on that line. That's a wall. Steady. And the other thing you can get from a VOR, from most VORs, is a measure of the distance that you are away from them. And that's done through this box here, the DME, Distance Measuring Equipment. And it gives you a couple of useful bits of information. One is telling me that I'm 1.8, 1.9 nautical miles away, which is about 2 nautical miles north. And I've just intercepted the uh, VOR radial there, so I'm going to turn as indicated north here to track it away and as I say at this stage it'll be very sensitive but as we get like 10, 15, 20 miles away much much less sensitive and the other thing it's doing is it's telling me my speed relative to the VOR which is effectively a ground speed isn't it because the VOR is fixed on the ground so this is telling me my speed through the air and obviously the air is moving relative to the ground and this is so this gives you your ground speed it's gone down a bit it's climbed a bit too high there I'm so busy concentrating on the VOR that I'm uh, neglecting the, the basic flying of the plane anyway there we are so we're heading north now if I wanted to go to Detling let's say I think it's 117.3 which is another local um, VOR we'll dial that in and press that and immediately it's telling me to go to Detling I need to line up the making sure that the triangle is pointing upwards I need to steer just uh, north of west because I'm not going to do that this needle is going to start nagging me now and telling me that I'm drifting to the right of where the track that I asked for but, and that's how you navigate with VORs and um, you can get them in the air as I say here's Detling, D-E-T 278 degrees, 28 miles which matches perfectly with the DME that it's reading here 117.3 frequency 277 magnetic shift 3 get rid of that and uh, if we line that up we'll we'll get pretty much 277 there we go. so that all agrees it's always nice when everything agrees now I'm going to try and get a straight in approach to Manston The reason why I'm doing this is because eventually we're going to do what a, a qualifying cross country. We're going to fly down to Shoreham, and that's quite a long trip. And we're going to need to use VORs on the way down there. And we're not going to use GPS. And we might do a bit of flight planning as well. Well, we would need to do some flight planning, obviously. I know it's easy. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Derek, this is your backyard. You know where you are. How would we find our way around? And the answer is that you'd plan. Same as I did when I didn't know where I was. Saturday down there, Margate. <sighs> Everyone's packed into the DIY stores. Westwood Cross, big new shopping development. They built the shopping development first and then they decided to build the roads second. Can you believe that? going to cross the um, centre line for the um, airport in a minute so it's a it's a large airport I don't I'm not infringing on their airspace but obviously if they've got anything coming in I would like to know so let's press the key and um, select Manston I'll wait until he's Turn 
I'm waiting for him to um, get off the airwaves. Okay, good. I've turned to the right here because I just want to stay out of the way of his approach, as I say, in case he's got him. Um, oh, good, we've got uh, clearance to go straight in, so it means they don't have much traffic. The congestion in terms of um, air traffic is, uh, you know, the, the, the traffic on the frequency, rather, is actually an issue. You know, the, the, the waves are quite um, crowded. And I remember once I was flying to, where was it, I had to fly through Farnborough airspace and um, it was extremely busy and uh, Blackbush I think and as a result I had a real trouble getting into Blackbush because um, I couldn't get Farnborough to hand me off to Blackbush. Now the VOR system, the VHF Omnidirectional Rangefinder, is different from, from the instrument landing system. Although, confusingly, they both use this instrument. To the instrument landing system is the one that you use which um, helps you land when the visibility is very poor and you can't see the runway. Again, not, not used so much with private pilots, but uh, the bigger jets and, perhaps, and certainly twins. And you need something called an, an instrument flight rating to. Uh, let's. I'm quite high here, so I'm just going to pull up so I'm in the flap zone and then drop some flaps. I'll probably drop two degrees of flaps. In fact, what we'll do is we'll drop three degrees of flaps. Why not? Providing um, our speed's okay, there's no reason why we shouldn't. It makes for quite a hairy wild mouse type descent because you're practically standing the thing on its nose. But it's quite safe. The other thing that happens is uh, you get people with uh, call signs that are identical. So, for example, we're, we're a Golf Bravo Alpha Foxtrot Mike, and there might be a Golf Bravo Bravo Foxtrot Mike somewhere. And uh, occasionally, very occasionally, two of you end up um, on the same frequency. And to save time, air traffic control abbreviates everything. So they'll call you Golf Bravo Alpha Foxtrot Mike once, just to confirm. Let's take the flaps up one stage to confirm that you're, um, that they've got your readback correct but then after that they abbreviate that and call it Golf Foxtrot Mike and of course if there's two of you they'll call you both Golf Foxtrot Mike which means that they'll be issuing clearances and um, I'm going to fly down the runway a bit like I said like I said you shouldn't do let's put the three flaps down control tower won't see anything strange about this they'll just see a idiot pilot who doesn't seem to be able to land properly but we'll know that we're a, a wily pilot that doesn't really like to taxi there we go turn next taxiway really thank you so much and we're off Right. Well, there's a problem with the strobe on this plane. I'm going to have to take it in for a service at uh, some point. So uh, our service agent is over in Thurrock. So we'll have to have a trip over to Thurrock at some point. Um, and that's a grass strip. And uh, like um, the VOR today, they can be sometimes a little bit difficult to find, these things. If you know where they are, then if you've seen them once, then you're fine. Uh, but when you're looking for something the first time, uh, it's very, very difficult to see it, even if it's right in front of you. So anyway, perhaps we'll go to Tharak and perhaps we'll do something else. Anyway, I'll put the plane away and do the logs and uh, hopefully I'll see you next time.